Welcome to the Bigger Pockets Business Podcast, show number 79. Welcome to a real world MBA from the School of Hard Knocks, where entrepreneurs reveal what it really takes to make it. Whether you're already in business or you're on your way there, this show is for you. This is Bigger Pockets Business. How's it going, everybody? Jay Scott here, and Mrs. Carol Scott is there. How you doing today, Mrs. Carol Scott? So super awesome. Guess what we got in the mail today? What did we get in the mail today? I haven't even checked the mail today. We got that book. Ooh. Yeah, that book. We got a book in the mail today. So guess what, everybody? We are interviewing... Uh, a while out. I can't tell you. I know it's on the tip of my tongue, but I can't tell you who it is. A very prominent business author we all know and love. We just received an advanced copy of his new book. And I'm so excited to dig into it and cannot even wait to talk to him soon. You're going to love that show. And yep. so will we. So anyway, that's what we got today. Good day. Good that, day all around. That's awesome. But we can't say who it is yet. But okay. I can say who our guest today is. That's no longer a secret. So our guest today is Matt Rodak. He is the founder of a company called Fund That Flip. And Fund That Flip is, it's a real estate crowdfunding company, which means it's a company that provides funding for real estate investors who are looking to borrow money, um, while at the same time offering opportunities for investors looking to passively lend money on real estate. Basically, they're a marketplace that matches up real estate borrowers and real estate lenders. And Matt has been a friend and a colleague of mine since he asked me to join the Fund That Flip Board of Advisors back in 2015 when he started the company. So I am affiliated with the company, full disclosure. Um, but I am super honored to have been able to watch his journey and the company's journey and from the inside see the phenomenal growth of his company over the past five years. Now, over the past five years, Fund That Flip has originated over over $500 million in loans. And during the first half of the episode, Matt talks all about how he conceived of the company, how he built it, and how he grew it. But it's the second half of this episode that's the real magic. So Matt walks us through his detailed roadmap for business success, the five stages of growth that all entrepreneurs should follow um, if they're starting and scaling a business and if they want to start and scale their business successfully. The entire discussion is absolute gold and I'll be honest, it's going to forever change the way I think about how successful businesses evolve. So make sure you listen for the second half of this discussion where Matt walks through his five stages of growth and make sure you start employing it in your business today. Now, if you want more information about Matt, about Fun That Flip, or about anything else we talk about on the show, please check out our show notes at biggerpockets.com slash bizshow79. Again, that's biggerpockets.com slash bizshow79. Now, without any further ado, let's welcome Matt Rodak to the show. Matt, we are so excited you are here today. We have so been looking forward to chatting with you more about Fun That Flip. So welcome to our show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah. So let's start with, for those that aren't familiar with uh, with Matt Rodak and Fun That Flip, tell us a little bit about your business and then maybe take us back and tell us a little bit about you and how you got started. Yeah, so we are a short-term lender that specializes in uh, bridge loans, hard money loans, private money loans, depending on how you want to define it, specifically focused on one to four family properties. Um, with, a, with a nationwide aspiration and currently about in, in 19 states, primarily on the east, east coast of the United States. Um, so uh, we provide six to 18 month term loans for people that are flipping houses. We also have a new construction product. So people are doing ground up construction. Um, people that are, you know, buying homes, fixing them up, and then tenanting them um, to, to to build out their rental portfolio. So we really specialize in providing that bridge financing to get to stabilization. The other thing that's somewhat unique about our business is um, how we capitalize those loans or finance those loans. Is we've built a, an online platform that allows uh, accredited investors to participate in those loans in five thousand dollar increments and earn anywhere from an eight to ten percent return 
um, secured by those underlying first position mortgages. So we've built a quote unquote crowdfunding platform or peer to peer lending platform um, specific for these, these bridge loans. Um, and over time, we've also built out an institutional um, uh, trading platform as well. So we work with publicly traded REIT, we work with an insurance company, we work with some hedge funds. Um, and the reason for that really is for our borrowers um, through this one point of, of uh, contact on that flip, um, you get access to a very diverse and broad array of capital. So if you paper really well and your deals right down the fairway, we can get you into the REIT money, which is going to be you know the best program for that. If you've got what we call a story deal, right, which maybe is a little bit funny, um, right, where the institutions kind of can't wrap their head around it, but fundamentally the deal makes sense. We've got capital pools for that. So it's a way for us to say yes more to our borrowers and help our, our, our customers there um, really focus on, on what they do best, which is finding good properties, renovating them and getting, getting them back into market. Okay. And wow. Okay. So there's a million things to talk about there. <laughs> um, and I want to dive in, but first I want to hear just a little bit about you. So how did you get started? Uh, what is your background? Were you in real estate before this, or were you in finance before this? What led you down the path to starting this company? Yeah, so my story goes all the way back to, to high school, actually. So I had a I had a small landscaping business in high school, and um, for whatever reason, I ended up ended up doing a lot of landscaping work for people like you guys, real estate investors. So um, at a, at a relatively young age, got this really cool experience. We'd come in and we'd do obviously the landscaping work, but we'd occasionally also get asked to help with the demos and the cleanouts because we were cheap labor with trucks and trailers, right? So um, got to see kind of the inside of these homes and even the outside of the homes and over time watched how they went from, right, this property that was really depressing the neighborhood and bringing down the value of the, the other homes turn into one of the nicer, you know, nicer homes on the blocks. And I thought, man, that's, that's really cool in terms of like how these guys and gals are transforming these neighborhoods. The other thing that got me hooked, honestly, right, is they, they were never shy to tell me how much money they were making, right? So 30, 40, 50, 60 K a pop. And I was like, oh, that's, that's cool. They're doing something, you know, with a vision, but also making some money on it. So at a pretty early age, I decided, I think that's what I want to do when I grow up. So uh, sold the landscaping business, went off to college, uh, studied finance with really the, the, the goal to get into some type of real estate development on the, on the back end of graduation. Um, I graduated right in 2007, um, so arguably the worst or the best time maybe to get into real estate development, but there weren't a lot of people hiring. So um, I had to get a job. I ended up taking a, a corporate job with a large Fortune 500 company, an insurance company that um, also insured other Fortune 500 companies, so very big um, very big properties. Um, and they had a they had a middle market group that was kind of a step down from Fortune 500 companies. And I I got started with them is uh, is what was called a production underwriter. So it was one part business development and one part um, looking at risk and underwriting risk and pricing risk and structuring and you know relatively complex insurance programs. Um, this company was interesting because they were mostly engineers. So their their whole kind of thesis was um, engineer uh, risk out of loss and and help customers save money and help the the business save money. But what that resulted in was not a lot of business people in the business. So I was one of the few business people. And because of that, I think um, I figured out what we had and we had a really good product um, and uh, I became really good at selling it. So within, I think, 18 months of starting that job, I was leading the company on a global basis and new business production. Um, enough so that I got kind of the attention of, uh, you know, some of the people that were running the company and they called me up and, and asked me two questions. One was like, what are you doing? And two, do you think you could teach the rest of the company how to do that? So had an opportunity at a pretty young age to move out to, to Rhode Island, um, which is where the company was headquartered and work very closely with the, the senior executives of that middle market company and, and institutionalize a sales and marketing function. So they had they had grown themselves from $50 million to I think $650 million over an eight year period and had never institutionalized their sales and marketing function. Um, so that was my job, built CRM systems, we built training, we built um, new websites. I got to, to really get my hands dirty kind of in the technology world, really as an SME and kind of business expert. Um, and I did that for the better part of three years. And I, I like to say it was kind of my mini MBA um, where I learned a ton. Um, I like to say the biggest thing I learned was that I didn't want to be an insurance executive the rest of my life. So um, started kind of putting a plan in place uh, to exit corporate America. That's when I learned about bigger pockets. That's when I learned about um, both of you guys and what you're doing and started reading your books and um, got plugged into uh, the local real estate community up in Providence and 
partnered on some deals, worked for free for some people to kind of learn the ins and outs, did a couple of deals. And through that experience, I learned of the hard money lending space or the private money lending space. So this is this is circa 2012, right? 2013. And, you know, credit was still tight. Banks certainly weren't lending to fix and flippers. And um, in in the market that I was operating, there was this local hard money guy. His name was Gino. And if you wanted to borrow money, you went to Gino, you paid him four points, 14% interest. He had a uh, no joke, an eight page paper application um, without an email address to send it to, only a fax number. Um, you know, and you'd send this thing in, and two days later, he'd call you back and be like, Yeah, I don't really like that street address. And I was like, Why did I fill out eight pages if all you needed was a street address? Right. So it was just super like mind numbing and kind of frustrating from a you know, from a borrower's perspective, and I'd heard stories about getting stood up at the closing table, and like it kind of came close a couple of times to me to do that. And I was just like, this is this is broken. This whole kind of industry around lending money to people that are investing in real estate is broken. And as someone who was trying to like scale a business, I was like, this is gonna be impossible to scale this business unless I can figure out, you know, a reliable source of capital. Um, so that was kind of like insight one, right? It was like there seems to be a need for um, a reliable capital provider for experienced, right? People that want to grow their real estate businesses at the same time and kind of separate from all this, right? I was doing investing peer to peer investing on, um, again, pretty early, early to the, to the game of uh, prosper and lending club. So these were new ideas. Again, credit was tight. Consumer credit was tight. These innovative entrepreneurs came up with this idea of, well, let's make credit available to people that need it and then syndicate, right? Fractionalize, if you will, those consumer loans into as small as I think $50 amounts and let everyday people invest in those consumer loans. Um, so I was doing some of that on the side. I had a small portfolio and I'm getting a you know nine or 10% return on unsecured consumer loans that theoretically can go to zero. And I'm paying Gino 18% for a first position mortgage with 20% equity and like, and I'm scratching my, my finance degrees coming back and being like, well, that doesn't make sense, right? On a risk adjusted basis, this hard money loan is a much better risk, in my opinion, than this unsecured consumer loan. Why, right? Like why, right? And, and kind of you break it all down and it's like, well, the reason why is because like this hard money lending space is in the shadows. It's not institutionalized. It's not standardized. They're not using big data. It's reliant upon, you know, in this case, Gino's local knowledge of a market to make, you know, smart underwriting decisions. So kind of that, well, like, let's fix this, right? Let's, let's, let's create a better experience for borrowers. Let's create this, uh, this new asset class for investors to invest in. It seems they have an appetite for yield if they're willing to buy unsecured consumer loans. I should be able to sell an asset backed loan, right? At, uh, at, you know, comparative rates. And let's bring technology to bear. So you don't have to fill out an eight page paper application. You can put some simple data points in. We can pull some data from third party sources and, you know, we can, decision faster and smarter um, by leveraging, you know, some of the tools that are available to us in 2015, which is what, you know, at the time when I started. So, so you had like this idea, basically Gino's idea of hard money lending, not, not Gino's idea, but basically you saw him doing it. You saw the opportunity. Um, and then at the same time, you saw Prosper and Lending Club, which were a couple of platforms that I was actually on at the time as well, funny enough. And you said, hey, I can marry these these opportunities. So so Lending Club and Prosper are great. Um, they're providing a service, um, but the returns are relatively low compared to the risk. And Gino is doing these these secured loans where the risk is really low, but getting these ridiculous rates. I can marry the two and actually create a company. Was your thought at the beginning, I'm going to create a big company, or was this, eh, I can be a local? hard money lender that kind of arbitrages money with, with, with other, other people that are providing the capital. Um, and maybe I'll just do this in my, my local city or local town. What was your original plan? Yeah, I don't, you know, that's a really good question. I never actually thought about that. I don't know that I ever had aspirations to set out, you know, set out to create a, the next billion dollar company or anything like that. I just really wanted to do this, right? Like I was, passionate about real estate. I actually didn't like flipping houses having done it. Like I didn't like picking paint colors and looking at a hundred properties to buy one. And like, but I knew I liked to be around real estate. So like this gave me this, the, the ability to be around and be in the game, but not have to like be in the minutia, right? I could partner with people like yourself, right? That are really good at that kind of stuff and play a different part in the, you know, in the, in the ecosystem, if you will. So 
Um, I think it was really more of just like, I really want to do this. And I think it's interesting. I think the more that we started to think about the idea is it did need to have some national scale, right, for our investor base to, to kind of fully deliver um, the value proposition to investors that are investing in our, our portfolio, right? We didn't want to just say, hey, like we've got a bunch of loans in Rhode Island or Cleveland, Ohio or wherever we were at. Like part of the value proposition to our investors is you can invest in Rhode Island or Texas or Arizona or Florida, right? And if you've got a different perspective around those different markets or you want to just build a diversified portfolio and get exposure to right? A broad base of, of different types of properties, um, being in multiple markets, you know, started to become more important for, you know, for that reason more than, than anything else, I would say. Yeah, that makes absolute perfect sense. And I love hearing all of this evolution of not only the beginning of the company, but all of the things that you were doing that led up to it. Like clearly you had some significant leadership experience in marketing and sales and finance and technology all put together into one, along with this being in this hard money lending space um, and wanting to stay in the real estate space. And I want to hear more and more about that evolution. I would like to set the stage even further though, because I think this is a really important thing for anybody who owns a business, right? So in Fun That Flip, it sounds like you essentially have really two different customer bases that you are you have this value proposition for, like you mentioned, right? You have the real estate investors, and then you have these entrepreneurial capital investors, right? So what did you do to structure your business so that you could really effectively meet the needs of those very different, uh, those very different two parties? Yeah, another great question. This is something that we struggled with. And to some extent, right, we're a, we're a marketplace business, right? Where you have to, you got to have supply and demand, right? For the, for, you know, the market to, to operate efficiently. Um, and marketplace businesses are inherently difficult to start, right? Because of that, you're serving two different, two different customer bases. Um, I'll never forget. I had a, I had a really good conversation. We went through an accelerator program here in New York and I went, I went, had a conversation with a guy that finally like really helped this click for me. And what he said was like, you don't have to convince me that you're going to find people to invest in your deals because of the yield, because of the short duration, because of the asset, you know, back nature of it, as long as you've got good deals. Right. So like, in a, in a way, what he was saying was like the capital is fungible, right? Like the capital is kind of like the commodity piece and who your customer is and who you have to, you, he was an investor, right? He's like, what you have to do to convince me to invest in your business is that you can acquire borrowers at scale because like, I believe you can get the capital, right? Like that, the capital is not going to be your problem. Um, and that was like a big aha moment for us kind of early on of like, who is our customer? Our customer is the real estate operator, right? The sponsor, the borrower, you know, whatever you want to, whatever, you, you know, name you want to ascribe to them. Um, that said, right, like in kind of how we think about it internally is our, our investors on our platform are certainly customers. We have customer service professionals there. We spend a lot of money and time on, on marketing and everything else. But internally, we almost think of them more as like suppliers, right? So like you still have to have good relationships with your suppliers, whether it's your you know, flooring supplier or paint supplier or whatever, right? And there's a competitive advantage of having good suppliers. So like the capital side of our business is almost thought of like the supply side, right? And our borrowers are thought of as like our customer side. Um, and, and that's kind of how we've, we've thought about growing the business, right? Is like, if we originate good loans to good people on good projects, people are going to, are going to want to supply us that capital, right? Um, so where we spend, you know, if you look at our, our, org chart, right? I've got, I don't know how many salespeople. And, you know, if you look at our P and L where we spend marketing dollars, it's 90% borrower and 10% kind of investor. Um, you know, realizing there's still an investment there, right. To attract those suppliers. But, um, you know, that's kind of how we, we, we reconcile those two different things. So, okay. And this is interesting because, um, in theory, in a marketplace like this, um, you don't, well, you obviously have to find good deals because, uh, your, your lenders are going to want good deals to, to lend to. Um, but in theory, um, the, the volume is more important than good deals because in theory, you put a million deals out there, your lenders find the good ones and they pick and choose and then they fund those deals. But in reality, 
it's not in your best interest to put a whole bunch of bad deals out to the marketplace um, because then it's basically the onus is then fully on the lender to do the underwriting. It's fully on the lender to make sure that their capital is, is somewhat secure. So it's in your best interest to do some upfront underwriting before you put a deal out in the marketplace, I assume. So yep. what what is the philosophy of the company? Do you, if, if I submit a deal to you, um, are you even going to look at that deal before you throw it out to the marketplace or are you just going to pass it through? Are you going to underwrite it? Um, what is, what is your, 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 what do you foresee or what do you see as your role as the marketplace owner of ensuring that the deals that go out to, to lenders in the market, um, are reasonable deals? Yeah. So a couple of things there, and, and maybe if you allow me, I'll stick with the analogy, right. Of like, if you do a bunch of if you do a bunch of bad deals, right, you you guys as flips and you buy a bunch of paint and a bunch of flooring and your your deals are bad and you can't pay your suppliers, are your suppliers going to sell you paint and flooring anymore? No, right? So like now you're forced with like going and finding new suppliers and hoping like in the market, you know, the mark the supplier market doesn't learn about your your failures previously of paying your bills, right? So it's it's kind of the same thing, right? If we don't treat our suppliers well, we don't pay them, which is how, we, how do we pay them? Our loans have to perform, right? If our loans don't perform, we can't pay our suppliers and we can't pay our suppliers, our suppliers go away. And it's expensive to sign up new good suppliers, right? That like you want to do business with and that can kind of help you also grow your company, right? So sticking with that analogy, like we're aligned to do good deals because we've got to pay our suppliers if we want the suppliers to keep supplying us with capital. Um, the way it actually works on our platform is, is kind of, there's some other controls there, right? If that's not enough for you, um, we underwrite every loan and we only fund about, you know, five or 6% of the projects that we see. Um, so we see a lot of inbound, right? Our marketing's doing a good job of like, you know, bringing leads into us. Um, we also fund everything before we take it out to the crowd. So we've got different, um, balance sheet capital, if you will, that is like our working line, right? That we originate the loan. So, so by the time a, an investor, whether it's a retail investor, or one of the institutional investors we work with sees that loan, it's the deal's already done. We've already determined it's a loan that we like and fits our box. And effectively we're betting that it's going to, um, also pass the mustard of our investors, right. In, in their due diligence. Um, Otherwise, we're, we're, it gets stuck, right? And it becomes a product that we can't sell and that, that capital can't be recycled into new loans. So um, just mechanically, that's kind of how it works. And we can talk about why it has to work that way. But, um, you know, that's, that's one thing that kind of controls us and aligns our incentives with our investor base on doing good deals. The second piece is not an insignificant amount of our revenue comes from what's called interest rate spread. So we'll originate a loan, let's say at 10%, we'll sell it through to our investors at 9%. Um, we only earn that 1% right interest rate spread if the borrower is paying their interest payments, right? And if the borrower ultimately pays us back. Um, so if we originate a bunch of bad loans, one, we're not gonna we're not gonna generate that interest spread, which we count on as part of a, a big part of our PL, but we still have to deal with them all, right? So it's a loss of revenue and an increase in expense, which, um, you know, isn't a good equation for business. So we, we, we do, we do think it's very important that we have an aligned incentive with our investor base, which is one of the reasons why we're not brokers, right? We're, an, we're an originator. Like we take some balance sheet risk. We take some revenue risk, um, alongside with our investors to make sure that, you know, we're held, we're held to account effectively on, on doing good loans. Okay, so that's really interesting. Uh, basically, you're pre-funding your deals, which is good for your your um, your operators, your investors, um, because they don't necessarily have to wait the two weeks, four weeks, twelve weeks, whatever it is, um, to see if there's going to be enough interest from from uh, marketplace lenders to get their deals funded, so they can move a lot faster. But what then is the benefit to the company? If you can, if you can go out and borrow money from a hedge fund or or REIT or someplace else, and, and you can bring in a lot of capital, what is the benefit to you to then go and replenish that capital from the marketplace lenders? I mean, doesn't that just add additional complexity and overhead and and work um, when that capital is available from other sources anyway? 
Yeah, it's a great question. And, and uh, interestingly enough, if, I think if you went out and surveyed our borrower base, right, the sponsors, 90% of them wouldn't even know that we have a crowdfunding platform, right? So like, it's not even something that like we talk to them about because like they don't care, right? They just want to know that like their loan can get funded and like we're going to show up and, you know, do what we say we're going to do and we're competitively priced and com competitively, competitively leveraged. So yeah, it's a, it's a big thing that we, again, one of the early learnings was like, you can't create any uncertainty around funding for sponsors. Cause like, as you guys know, like you've got EMD to earnest money deposits down, right? Like you're trying to run a business. So like when we put a term sheet out, like that's a hundred percent, it's committed. The money gets earmarked in our systems. Like we're going to come through to close when we say we're going to close and we're going to handle kind of the back end capital markets piece of that later. And again, like customers don't even know, right? They don't know if they're necessarily, if their loan got placed with a REIT or on the retail platform. Um, which again is kind of that, it is part of the value prop that we do talk to our borrowers about of like, Hey, you're going to get, you're going to get the best terms because like we've built this really efficient way to place paper, um, you know, to ensure that you get the best terms. The reason, the reason for the retail base. And I think, uh, COVID is, has provided us this opportunity to prove this thesis out. Um, one of the one of the things that I, I kind of learned, at least from the sidelines during kind of the 2007, 2008 um, credit crisis was that a lot of the institutional capital group thinks, right? And a lot of these guys are tied into, into kind of two or three or four big banks that provide them a lot of, um, you know, call it warehouse facility, lines of credit. And when one of them goes, they all go. Um, right. So what we didn't, what we didn't want to have was a, bu a business that was rel relying upon one supplier. It's the same reason why you probably have multiple floor flooring suppliers or multiple general contractors in your business, right. Is you've built in a certain amount of redundancy and a certain amount of resilience, right. Into, into your business for when the market changes. Right. So I've been asked this question more times than I can kind of count, right. Of like, why not get rid of the crowd? Um, and, the, and the reason is, is because that crowd is a super elastic supplier, right? And what we saw, even like if you go all the way back to 2015, we were originating loans and the market was still pretty, pretty hard back then from a lending perspective. We could originate loans in the 12s and 13s and we'd pass, you know, 11s and 12s and 13s through to our investor base. And that attracted a certain type of investor who was like really kind of yield hungry. Um, and they were okay with the fact that we were a startup and like, we kind of say like, there's the real estate risk, right. And there's the platform risk, right. So like you're investing in the note, but you're also kind of betting that fund that flip is going to be around long enough to service that note. Right. So early days, right. We were passing through high interest rates and we attracted a certain type of investor who was like, was cool with the 12% and also cool with the platform risk. Right. And then as the business evolved and as we got more traction, we saw those 12s come down to 11s and 10s and 9s. And right now we're in the 8s and even in the 7s. And a lot of those 12 percent investors have matured out of the business, if you will. Right. Because like the yields no longer interesting. But what we have seen come in is this new type of investor who when they saw the 12, they were like, whoa, like that feels risky. Um, and right, the platform risk and some of these other things that we've 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 worked on mitigating over the years. So we've got a different type of investor now that invests at you know eights and nines than what invested early on. So COVID happens, right? And guess what happens? All of my institutional guys went away. March seventeenth, all four of them. I got four phone calls, and then we've got a couple institutions that invest on the platform. All called and said, "We're done. Can't do anything. Our bank shut us off. Like, good luck." Right? So we had I don't know fifteen or twenty million dollars worth of loans on our on our warehouse facility. And I was like, we got to clear these off the warehouse facility for right the reasons that we have to based on the covenants that we make in that facility. And who bailed us out? The retail, right? So we had to pull some levers from a pricing perspective and you know do a lot more in a communication perspective. And we went out and took videos of all of our properties and we, we did things, but we had this group of a thousand plus retail investors. And if we priced things right and told the right story, we were eventually over you know a couple months able to clear off that warehouse facility. So it proved true in a lot of ways of like, you know, this resiliency and this kind of um, elasticity of supply, right, that you can have by having a very broad base of, of capital providers. So that that's kind of like in a worst case scenario, but also right in a even in normal times, I mentioned the story deals, right? We we funded a bridge loan up in Boston, um, I think it was last month, and it was kind of a weird deal, right? This guy was buying this warehouse. It was a 
costume manufacturing facility that had been owned in the family in an up and coming neighborhood. And he's buying it for a sweet deal and was getting it through permitting. And he's going to make 2 million bucks on this project. Right. But like he needed a, he needed a lender that could lean into that business plan. None of my institutions are going to buy that loan. Right. But we priced it right. And our retail guys filled it up, I think in like 48 hours. Right. So like it allows us to help our customers on some of these, like, it's a weird deal, but like, it makes sense, right? As soon as he gets it through permitting and builds his 32 unit apartment building on it, um, you know, there's a there's a tremendous tremendous amount of value creation kind of in that in that exercise. So um, that's kind of the the long story, and kind of it provides a ton of resiliency, but it also provides a lot of flexibility in the things we can say yes to. That's so fascinating that you've grown into all of these different different types of deals with different types of investors going after such a wide breadth of different avenues um, for the business, right? So I'm curious, over the years, how have you just gone about growing the business? How have you found the investors? And how are you ensuring you consistently have deal flow? How do you market for the investors? Just what are the big things that you've done or that you are currently doing or a combination of both that are really just continuing to grow the business? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, uh, so we'll talk about the borrower side, right? So we've, uh, we have kind of what we call our air and ground game. So our air game is traditional marketing. We, we spend uh, not an insignificant amount of money on Google AdWords, on Facebook, on, right, finding out the, the different ways to, to communicate awareness about who we are, what we do, and how we can help people. And kind of the idea there is drive people back to a website and convert them into some type of an action, whether that's apply for a loan or apply for a, you know, we have a pre-approval letters, right, that we do for people, right? So like now you have something that you can take with your offer to say, hey, like I've been vetted by this firm that specializes in this type of, of lending and, um, you know, helps our prospective customers, right, bid on properties with more confidence. Um, and then our ground game is our sales team, right? So we've got people in markets that are um, networking with our current customer base. And you guys know this, right? Flippers talk to each other. They know one another. They they get together, they compare notes, and they, they collaborate around. That's one of the things I like about this business is people that should be competitors are usually friends, right? And like, you know, they, they try to help each other grow their businesses. Um, so you do a good job for one guy and he tells his friend, right? Hey, you should check out fund that flip. And we try to earn our way into that business. And then also finding who are the attorneys that primarily are focused on real estate investors or real estate agents or title companies. Um, and then look for ways to add value, right. To those groups. Um, you know, and, and, you know, the understanding that if you add enough value to people and show them how you can help their world, you know, eventually gets the opportunity to, to understand who, who their Rolodex is. So, that's how we've done it on the borrower side and, and um, it's worked you know reasonably well for us. Um, on the investor side, pre-COVID, I wanna say we were spending $1,000 a month on investor marketing. So like not a lot on a million dollar plus marketing budget, right? Um, you know, so, so that was kind of the same thing. It was like, we have this, uh, we have this fantastic asset that people can invest in and like, let's just make it really easy for them. Right. So, um, you know, one of the reasons that we kind of the core thesis of the business was focused on residential, you know, one to four family assets is like most people can understand that, right. You don't have to be a sophisticated real estate investor or read a lot of books or right. Like most people have bought a house, right. Lived in it and seen that house appreciate. And most people can appreciate, Oh, this guy's buying the house for X. He's going to spend Y to fix it up and he's going to sell it for Z and I can hop on Zillow and kind of see if those numbers more or less make sense. And do I have a perspective on Charlotte or Columbus or Indianapolis or whatever, right. That I have enough conviction. Um, so a lot of our investor kind of growth on the retail side has been all organic. Um, you know, that's the other thing, like most rich people know other rich people and they also like to sit around at right, the country club and talk about the cool new thing that they're investing in and um, show their friends on the phone, right? The new site and the deals that they've invested in. So um, we've tried to build, right? Some um, viralness, I guess, if you will, to, it's fun too, right? Like I, I have a decent amount of in, in my personal dollars invested on our platform. Um, quick plug. I read a, I read a blog post once a month called dog fooding that kind of outlines all the deals that I've invested in. Um, but like it's, a uh, every, we, we process interest payments the 15th of every month. So you get paid current on these investments and like 
I look forward to the 15th of every month, right? Cause it's like this little like drip of serotonin of, you know, a couple thousand dollars into my bank account. And like, I didn't do anything. Right. So like, it's somewhat, a somewhat addicting, I guess, in terms of, uh, you know, you perform enough for people and then, you know, they kind of stop thinking about it and just, right. They've allocated a certain amount of dollars and telling their friends and it grows from there. Awesome. So to whatever extent you're comfortable, can you talk to us a little bit about the growth of the business? I know you guys have raised some money recently and you've expanded, uh, you've added a second headquarters. Um, tell us about like whatever, again, whatever you're comfortable sharing in terms of like the volume you're doing and your money raise and, and your, your growth and scale. Yeah. So I'll give the quick trajectory, right? Like I think we did 3 million of loans our first year and then 20 million our second year and then 60 million and then 120 million and then 180 million. Um, you know, so it's kind of been the, you know, we, we've, we've not been the fastest growing lender in the space by any means. Right. But I think we've tried to do it. Um, the word we use internally a lot is responsibly. Um, so it's not just responsible for our lender's sake, but also responsible for our borrower's sake. Um, I don't know how many times we've told people not to do deals, right? Like we could have lent on the deal and been safe, right? From our loan to value and, in right. Our attachment point. Um, but like everything told us like the guy wasn't going to make money on it. Right. So like, we've tried to be responsible for our borrowers too, of like, Hey man, like maybe let's not do this one and let's go find another one. Um, but yeah, I mean, we've, uh, you know, we raised some some venture capital money in 2016, about $2 million. And we, we kind of came out of that raise with uh, a very specific plan of one, getting to something that we called meaningful scale. So for us, that was, you know, more than $100 million of loan originations in a 12 month period. Um, and also do so with positive unit economics or profitability, right? So um, what what was important to me, and maybe this is kind of my finance and my insurance background, was not to build a really big money loser. Um, it was to build a really big money maker, right? So um, I wasn't totally convinced that that was possible to do at a billion dollars, right? Like maybe Gino can make money at the $20 million book of business, but no one's really proved out you can make a lot of money in this business at any significant scale. So um, that was kind of the goal coming out of the raise in 2016. We accomplished that in 2018, being both profitable and well north of $100 million of originations. Um, and then it was kind of a, like, well, we can keep this pace of growth, which wasn't slow by any means, but we also saw a huge opportunity to raise some additional capital to go harder into that growth. So uh, we had a really, I think, compelling story to take out to the venture capital private equity world in the beginning of 2019. We closed um, an $11 million uh, round of financing in August of 19. Um, and most of those use of proceeds, right, was kind of into, into three buckets. Spend more on, on sales and marketing, right? And we had developed um, enough of a track record around spend $1 and hopefully you get multiple of that spend. Welcome to New York City. There's the the uh, <laughs> proverbial ambulance. I don't know if you guys heard that, but we're going to get at least oh, we one. <laughs> uh, Right. So like we had a story around like we knew if we spent one dollar, every dollar we spent on marketing, we got some multiple of that in return on revenue. Right. So it was a really easy thing to tell our prospective investors of like we're going to earmark X millions of dollars of this 11 million to go into this channel. Right. Um, and then the, the, the second bucket was um, was uh, capital markets. Right. So how do we invest in new products on the capital market side to one? Um, create new ways for investors to gain exposure, passive investors to gain exposure to this asset class. And two, can we, um, you know, lower our cost of capital by getting bank relationships and growing out the institutional. So again, we can be more competitive with signing up new borrowers. And the third big bucket was technology. So we haven't talked a lot about this, but we've, um, we've got a, you know, a technology team of, I think, 10 full-time people, right? That's is everything from product to designers to engineers. Um, and the thesis here is that um, originating a loan is not um, particularly complex, right? Like we've been doing it for hundreds of years, but there's so many inefficiencies around everything from putting the paperwork together to ordering appraisals to, you know, running title reports, right? So a big part of our thesis is that we can make this entire loan origination process work better with technology. And by doing so, right, we can create a more profitable enterprise, which can then be reinvested in 
um, you know, either additional products and services for our customers or a more competitive product, or probably more likely some combination of the two. Right. Um, so, um, yeah, that happened in last August, we were foot on the gas hiring people and, um, you know, had a really good plan in place and had our best quarter ever in Q1 of 2020 and then COVID happened, but, um, we're, we're now back on track. So it's, uh, it's good. That is just an awesome growth story. And wow, I, it's it's amazing to look at these numbers, um, not just only in the in the in terms of dollars, but the number of people, the number of locations, the number of deals, just growth in in so many different metrics it, over just five years. So we're wondering, have you really found through these five years that you've been at it, Matt? Has I mean, this clearly didn't happen overnight. It didn't just, you know, just ex- just explode naturally without without any massive effort. So we're wondering if you've maybe maybe found some significant, if you could say like buckets or stages of growth uh, as as you've started growing. Could, is there is there anything like you can really cement around some significant pieces of that growth and evolution? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I think about this a lot, and I, I do some. Uh, I went through uh, when I moved to New York City, so I'm in New York City now. I, I moved down from Rhode Island to start the company, just kind of wanting wanting to get around a, a, a environment that I thought was be conducive to to building out a technology and financial company. So I moved to New York, and I got plugged into this group called the Founder Institute, which. For anybody that's listening and thinking about starting a, you know, a, a, particularly I think it's good for high growth kind of type of companies. Um, they they offer a fantastic service around like, why don't you test drive running a business or starting a company before you quit your day job, right? Service, um, right? And they put you through the paces of of you know what it means to start a company and you get to kind of taste it, if you will, before you you do it. Um, and I go back and I I mentor um, this group and I I like doing that because. You know, I kind of call it, you know, there's probably five different stages, right, that I've gone through throughout this journey. And, and the first one is like this aspirational stage, if you will, right, where, uh, and Jay, this is when you and I met, right, uh, when I was at the aspirational stage of Fun That Flip, where it's, the business is nothing more than an idea, right? And like, it's probably the most fun part of actually starting a business, in my opinion, because there's absolutely no limitations and you're not constrained by any realities, right, at this aspirational stage. Um, you know, you can do no wrong. It's a big idea. You've got all these different directions you're going to be going in and all these fantastic services that you, you know, you're going to provide to, to the world. Um, and, and, um, the, the biggest thing that I think, um, you know, people that get it right do during this aspirational stage is they try to kill their deal or they try to, they try to kill their, their business. So, you know, uh, you know, I think the best thing you can do kind of if you're at this aspirational stage of a business is you're going to have enough passion and you're going to get enough positive reinforcements from everyone you talk to about how great your idea is for the most part that like that will carry you through. Um, but what you really need to be doing is looking for all the reasons why this business is probably going to fail, right? Because it's just statistically speaking, most businesses do, right? It's like your job as an early, super early stage entrepreneur, in my opinion, right? That I think um, this is when it became real to me is when I, um, you go out and you talk to customers, right? And you say, hey, I have this thesis of X, Y, and Z. Would you buy this, right? Or would you, you know, would you hire me for this service or whatever it is, right? So like, I think the first thing that, you know, if you're in this aspirational stage that you need to be doing a lot of is going and talking out talking to people that will give you honest feedback about your business idea. And then as quickly as possible, trying to get people to pay you for it. Right. So like, I think the other thing that, that people do is like, I'll just give it, give it away for free to my first couple customers and like, see if they like it. Like that's in my opinion, the biggest mistake. Um, The people that are most likely to buy from you early are probably the ones that have the biggest problem and are most likely to pay you for it. And like, you should find a way to extract that value out as quickly as you possibly can. So like, if there's two, two kind of things I think people should do in their pursuit of trying to kill their business idea, it's one, talk to a lot of people and try to get um, people to pay you for it. And the second one is actually run a financial model. And like, this is one that like almost no one does, but like you could have a great idea that a lot of people are willing to pay you for that can never make money, right? So like, you know, a very detailed financial model around unit economics and understanding, 
you know, how many people you're going to have to hire and office space and marketing budgets. And, um, the other big one is like understanding the actual cash flow on a pro forma basis of the company, right? Like you may spend like for us, right? We spend money on marketing for borrowers that money goes out day one. It doesn't turn into revenue until sometimes day 95 or day 180 or day 360, right? So like you're out money and you don't get that money back, hopefully plus a profit for some time. And most businesses, actually not most businesses, all businesses don't go out of business because they've got a bad idea. All businesses go out of business because they run out of money, (laughs) right? So like most people, I think, you know, where they, you know, because I'm not good at math or I don't like math or math scares me like shy or like, I don't want to believe that my good idea can't make money shy away from this financial modeling exercise, which is like super important to do in my opinion during this aspirational stage. Okay. So that's really cool. So stage one is kind of this aspirational stage. And just to sum up, I mean, there's a lot of great information there, but to sum up two big things to be doing in stage one, uh, one need to talk to a lot of people, get people to pay you. And I loved your point about this is the part, uh, or this is the time frame where you should be actively trying to kill your business. You should be looking for reasons why it might not work so that you can dig in and you can determine, is this really as good an idea as everybody that's encouraged? me because you're going to have a lot of people that are encouraging you. Um, And then number two, run a financial model. If you can't do it yourself, go find somebody that understands the math and understands the finance and can help you put together a model because without that, it doesn't matter how good the idea is. It doesn't matter how good the team is. There's some ideas that just aren't going to pencil out. So love that. So that's the aspirational stage. What's the, what's the next stage? Yeah. So I think the next stage, which is a little bit less kind of sunshine and rainbows from the aspirational stage is the stage that I kind of call war mode, right? So like, let's say you come out of this aspirational stage, you decide you've got a real idea that can make money. You validate it with some real customers. Like the next kind of stage, I think, you know, again, we're talking about the psychological aspects of the business or the personality is like, you have to kind of go into like what I call war mode. Um, And what I mean by that is like, you are now at war. You're at war with incumbents. You're at war with new entrants into the market. You're at war with, um, you're at war because like literally every day it feels like you're going to be in a fist fight, whether that's with trying to win new business, with product development, with, you know, your finances, right? Like, and I don't mean this necessarily where you're, you know, you're, you're confrontational with people, but like, it feels like you're, right. You're in a war and like every day your resources are a bit more depleted, right? So, If you run out of resources, you lose, like we talked about before. So like you have to find a way to win like everyday battles while also conserving as many resources as you can, particularly if you're not, you know, well capitalized, like most businesses aren't when they get started. Um, Right. So like kind of the key learnings here, right, as you come out of this aspirational and I'm going to do this and I'm going to build a business, right. I don't know about you guys, but like if, if I'm going to war, like I don't want to go to war alone, right? It's so like the next kind of stage that you really want to be kind of focused on, I think, as you're you're moving out of this idea stage, if you're kind of doing it by yourself up to this point, is starting to build that team that you want to go to war with, right? So how do you, um, you know, you know, why are we fighting this war, right? What's the story? Like, how are you building kind of this excitement and this vision and enrolling people to effectively come work for you either for free or likely at a discount to their market value? And what are you willing to exchange for, um, for getting those, those types of people along for the ride with you, right? Um, the second kind of thing that I think is important during this, this, uh, while you're in war mode is you got to have a strategy. You got to have an understanding of like, where are we going, right? So for us, like our strategy and still is, was like, we are focused on one to four family houses. We're not gonna you know, chase these shiny objects when a apartment building comes in or an industrial building comes in or something that isn't like what we care about comes in. We're gonna stay super laser focused on this one kind of thing and doing it really well. But you also have to realize, and this is one of the, I think the advantages of being an early stage kind of business is you have to be willing to change course as the battlefield evolves. Right. So like this is the other mistake I see people make is they get they fall so in love, not with just the business idea and what they're trying to solve, but their strategy. And they're unwilling to let go of that strategy when right they're presented with new data or new information that is screaming in their face, do something different. Right. So like you got to have a strategy. You got to be able to give the marching orders to the team that you're building. 
but you also have to have um, somewhat of a decision-making process that's objective, um, that informs how your strategy may change. You know, the best, the best that you can, right, try to game that out, right? Like, hey, we're going to run hard into the strategy and these are the things that we wanna see work. And if they don't work, we're gonna process these data points and make some, you know, make some informed decisions based on these data points to evolve or change or modify our strategy, right? So, you know, not too dissimilar to kind of how, you're, how you are in the aspirational stage. You've also gotta be willing to kind of kill strategies that don't work, right? But you've also gotta be willing to commit to strategies um, to know that, you know, you gave it your best shot to actually get enough information to know, yeah, that strategy worked or it didn't. Um, and then kind of the third piece, I think in this war mode, you know, time of a business is that you've got to be committed to executing like ruthlessly on a day-to-day -day basis, right? So like there are no off days when you're in war mode. It's not like, you know, all of the rest of the universe is kind of taking a, a Saturday or a Sunday to kind of relax. Not that I'm saying you shouldn't, you know, find some time for yourself, but like you also have to be committed to executing ruthlessly against that strategy. Um, which sometimes means doing things that are uncomfortable to you. And, and I'm not talking about ethically. I'm talking about, I used to close our books out. That was my Sunday, right? I did, I did all of our journal and like our GLs on Sunday. That sucked. I hated that, right? But like someone had to do it in order to close the books out on a monthly basis. And we hadn't yet added any kind of finance or accounting person to the team, right? So you got to be willing to do things that you, you don't like doing or, or feel like you shouldn't have to do because you're the, you know, the CEO or the, the founder, because at the end of the day, what you should be committed to is not the strategy or to the idea, but to the problem that you're solving for society. Um, and you've got to be willing to kind of execute whatever that means um, while you're in that while you're in that war period of the business. And for what it's worth, like war mode could last years, right? So like, you know, it's not something that like could be weeks or months, right? Like until you figure it out and until you get beyond that. Um, that that day to day fight where things start to kind of turn in your favor, um, you know, I think you got to be committed to understanding that you know you could be at war for a while. Um, ben Horowitz wrote a good book called The Hard Thing About Hard Things. Um, highly, I think that's what it was called. Um, but anyways, I suggest checking out uh, checking out that book because I think it, it's a very good kind of practical lesson on the different types of stages of business and war mode being being one of them. Cool. So. Got to tell you, Matt, number one, the aspirational stage sounds sounds pretty darn fun. Way more fun. <laughs> War mode is just intense, right? That you go from like super fun, la la land, dreamy sunshine, rainbows and unicorns to war mode where it's getting really tactical, changing your strategies, killing your strategies, just hardcore stuff. Please tell me three, four and five have some more of a happy medium baked in there somewhere. Yeah. So, I mean, I think you come out of of war, right? And what's on the other side of war, if you, assuming you, you win, right? You got to win the war first, right? But assuming you win, right? You then go into peace mode, right? And, and um, you know, peace, peace mode is, is kind of back to that point. Like you can't have your people in war forever. You can't be in war forever. At some point, right? Um, your team needs to start to coalesce around, um, you know, what, what, um, what the business is going to look like, what battles do we win, what fights do we want to pick kind of going forward, but ultimately getting the business to a stable place. And, you know, this is the part of the business that setting things like your culture is super important, right? So I also kind of like to call this like the teenage years, right? Of like, you've, you've figured out product market fit, you've got some customers, you've got some channels that, you know, you're able to sell through at scale and it's repeatable and right. You that you're starting to figure out, like I spend a dollar here on marketing, I get $3 back in revenue, right? So you're starting to figure some of those strategies out and they're starting to stick. Now what becomes super important is like, what, what do we want to be when we grow up? Right. Which is why I call it the teenage years, right? Like we all remember when we turned like, you know, 13 and it was kind of like, well, am I, am I a jock or am I like, the emo kid or am I the, the nerdy kid? Like what, like, what am I? Uh, your business kind of goes through somewhat of a, a similar kind of stage where you either are very intentional around how you define that culture and who you want to be, or it takes its own life or it takes its own, it shouldn't say it takes its own life. It takes its own form. Right. Um, so I think, you know, coming out of that war mode and the war mode will define your culture a little bit. Um, I think, right. How you, how you act and how you react to things during that, that period. But the peacetime is really that opportunity of like, you know, I kind of like think of like in the U S right after we fought for our freedom, like 
we have this time where we're kind of like, who do we want to be as a country, right? And it defined our culture, right? So it's the same thing at a micro level on your company. What are your values? What are your mission? Now is the time to really codify those and, and revisit them. Maybe if you've started them earlier, is this right? Is this still who we are, right? So for us, we came up with this, um, this acronym called HUSTLE um, as we started to come out of our first war mode, I'll say first war mode, right? And HUSTLE is an acronym for um, hard work, unity, success, transparency, learn every day and empathy, right? So kind of like now how we define who we want to be collectively as an organization is really focused around one, the word hustle, I think kind of has a meaning, right? Of like, let's be scrappy. Let's do what we got to do. Like we may not be the smartest or fastest or most well-capitalized company, but like, damn it, we can work hard. Right. And like, we can be scrappy and like, you know, that's, that's kind of how we're going to define ourselves. So, you know, not only, you know, writing it on the wall, but how do you instill those things in kind of your everyday, right, interactions with one another and reinforce those things are, I think, super important kind of at peace mode. So it's setting the culture. It's also setting, you know, call it the laws, right? Like you got to have a framework by which you start to measure things around what is performance. Um, what are the KPIs for the company? What are the KPIs for the departments? What are the KPIs for each individual? Um, and how do we define success, but also how do we, um, how do we as an organization hold people accountable when they either do or don't achieve those level of successes, right? And it's super important during peacetime that everyone's on the same page of one, what is the culture of the organization here? And do we all believe and support and live that? But two, what is everyone's role within this new organization, right, that we're creating and what happens if someone doesn't follow the rules, right? And I think that becomes super important in order to stay in peace mode is that everyone understands there's this social contract and there's this agreement that people are gonna carry their fair share. And if they don't, um, there's, a, there's a very clear mechanism for either correcting those behaviors or exiting that person from the organization. Because um, if you don't get that right, right, you start to have infighting and coups and like now you're back in war mode, but instead of fighting the outside, you're fighting internally and like it's a quick death to the business. <laughs> I, 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 ahead, yeah, Jay. I love that. I was just going to say, I love this. This is so this great. is fantastic. This metaphor is awesome. And, and peace mode um, basically being that part of the process where um, you've you've kind of established yourself and now it's time to define yourself. So, so defining what success looks like. I love that. I love how you said defining what your success looks like through, through various means, including KPIs, um, and, and knowing what your organization really looks like, like in war mode, we're not necessarily focused on, um, on having lots of meetings to talk about the minutia in the business. We're focused on creating the business and gaining market share. Um, and, and now this is the point that in, in peace mode where we actually focus on defining what this business looks like and who we want to be. And I mean, I'm just repeating what you said, but it, it's great. I love the whole, what do we want to be when we grow up? And it's basically saying, let, let's create our persona. Let's create our brand. Let's create our, let's define who we are at this stage um, for as we get into the next phases. So what is the next phase? What is stage four? Yeah. So I think stage four and stage five kind of like they become somewhat of a fork in the road, right? For where the business is going to go. So you'll get to peace mode. You'll you'll develop the culture. Um, you'll have the rules. You have the KPIs, people performing. And eventually what will happen if you don't kind of do some of the other things we'll talk about next is you'll go into complacency mode, right? So people will forget what war mode was like, right? And they'll forget about how hard it you had to fight to get to this point. And if, if things aren't done appropriately, again, in my opinion, um, you'll start to settle into this, this is easy, right? And, um, and, and uh, you know, things will start to slip, right? So like, ah, oh, that person didn't hit their KPI, but I really like them and they're a great cultural warrior and like, they're nice. So like, oh, well, maybe we'll let it slide, right? So like, you're in peace mode for too long. And if you're not intentionally creating kind of some urgency and some, you know, some, uh, we'll talk about this next, but like, if you're not creating some, um, some level of urgency and some level of excitement around kind of what the company's doing and what you stand for, 
the, and the risk here is if you enter into complacency and the, the, the big challenge that I've seen, and this has happened to, to us, and I think probably every, every company that makes its way through is like, you know, for the people that have been around long enough, they, they remember war mode and they remember that sucked. Um, and they really like peace mode and how happy it is. And that slowly starts to kind of like edge into this complacency mode. And sometimes you don't realize you're in complacency mode until you start losing early high value employees because they're no longer challenged and fulfilled by the work that they're, they're right. They're doing right. So if you go back to like, you built this awesome team right in the beginning to go to war with you. Right. And then you've, you succeeded and you got to peace mode. Most of those people are like, they're warriors, right? They like the challenge of tackling big problems and building things and doing, going into unchartered territory. And now they've been kind of hanging out on their couch eating potato chips for too long and they're bored, right? If you enter into this complacency mode. So, you know, a sign of this is you start to feel um, discontent within your people. Um, maybe it gets hard to attract good talent, right? So like, you're trying to hire that new salesperson or that new CFO or that new COO and, and they can feel just this like, you know, this kind of doesn't feel that challenging to me. And you're scratching your head being like, what happened? Like, we're not in war mode. This is a great time to be coming <laughs> to work for fun that flip or whatever. Like, why wasn't I able to attract this person? And the, the reason being is if you're going through an interview process where they get to talk to enough people, they pick up on this vibe of like, these guys just don't care, right? Like they're just not that, it's not that exciting. Um, so complacency mode is kind of like one eventuality of the back end of peace mode. Um, and if you don't get ahead of that fast enough, you'll either find yourself back in war mode really quickly, right? Because you start to lose market share and revenue and the profitability starts to slip or worse, right? Like because the the fighting is internal instead of external, right? Like you implode from the inside, right? So like complacency, I guess, maybe isn't the net, it's not the inevitable next step, but it's like a next step that you should like make sure doesn't happen after you get kind of things stabilized into peace mode, right? So the the alternative to complacency, I think, is this idea of what I call like world domination. And it doesn't have to be world domination, but it could be market domination or, right, what is your, what is your, um, what is your business's like ultimate purpose, right? Maybe it is a lifestyle company that, you know, I can bring someone else in to, to run and like put the thing on autopilot, but like you've got to have some clear definition around like, what are we still striving for um, in this kind of like ideal last stage of a business? And to me, it kind of follows around like three things. The first one is like continuous improvement, right? So like, yes, we're in peace mode. Yes, we're doing a lot of things well, but like there's zero businesses in the world that can't get better, right? So what do we wanna do on a quarterly basis or a, an annual basis or even a weekly basis um, to create this culture? And it kind of goes back to culture now, this is the next evolution of culture. How do we build this um, culture within our organization so that good is never good enough, right? And so that everyone always believes there's there's a way that we can get better, whether it's, you know, better people that we hire for the next sales hire or uh, tweaking this process to take it down from 10 minutes to eight minutes, right? Whatever that is, like, how are we kind of going to continually focus on um, improving the company? And by virtue of that, what you really mean is you're setting an expectation for your people to get better every day. And like, particularly in today's world, I think that's what most people want, right? They want to be challenged and feel like they're getting better every day. And that's the, the thing that I love about companies is it creates a framework for people to, to achieve that personal improvement, right? So like the first one is, is, is kind of that idea of like, how do you start to build this continuous improvement culture into your company so you don't fall into complacency? The second one I think that I get excited about is particularly, you know, I think founders should be getting a lot of excited about is innovation, right? Now you've built this business that's successful, that has customers, right? That has good people in it. How do you leverage the assets that, you know, you've built over the years to like almost go back to Carol, what you think is exciting. What I agree with you is like, how do you create these small businesses within your business, right? How do you come up with either new products or new businesses or new services, right? That now puts you back into that aspirational stage of the company, right? But like not totally, right? Cause you have this other thing that works, but like you've now, now got these like really exciting projects or other businesses to start 
that, you know, really fills the rest of the team then up with, oh, we're starting what? Oh, that's cool. Like, how do I get, you know, how do I get part of that? And this kind of leads to the third point is like, what you're effectively doing is you're setting up war games instead of a war, right? So you're going to run that new business and that new idea through the same process, right? You're going to take it through the, you know, the excitement stage into war stage, into peace mode stage, right? And then ultimately into world domination. But it creates this sense of like, oh, we're still a startup. We're still young. We're still chasing these really big problems. We're still doing things that are cool and fun. And it reminds me of, right, the early days of the company, but also my paycheck's going to clear next week because we've built this other thing that like is working. Does that make sense? <laughs> That's yes, that so, Jay, I want to take this for a second because I think I, I I love all of these analogies and I especially love how you wrapped it up with world domination as the alternative to complacency mode and how critically important that is, especially with retaining your employees, right? I think a lot of us, if we think back to when we worked for other people, when we worked in corporations for a long time, the nature of entrepreneurs, right? That's where we got our start, many of us. And what were the companies that we were excited about and energized about? Those companies that offered lots of new, new things, new growth, new challenges, exciting, fun things. Things. But then I know I've certainly been in this position. I suspect a lot of us have. Once everything was just kind of rolling and it wasn't a big old challenge anymore and upper management was just perfectly happy to keep collecting paychecks and letting, letting stuff just work itself out, we just became bored, right? And we're yep. just like, get me out of here and into a new challenge. Yep. So I absolutely love how you've clearly defined the importance of continuing to improve, continuing to develop challenges so the company can evolve and people can evolve with it. And and, and the other thing I want to point out, and I, I'd love to hear you address this, Matt, because I, I'm guessing you've had some experience here, is that not every founder, not every entrepreneur is cut out for all four or five, depending on how you want to look at it, four A and four B uh, stages of this. There are certainly going to be founders who are really good at the aspirational stage and creating and having a vision. Um, there are going to be founders that are really good at the, the war mode stage where they're basically fighting to, to grow this company and, and are probably uh, – comfortable with chaos and turmoil and 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 then there're going to be those CEOs and I guess we think of them as CEOs that kind of come in and grow the company through peace mode and really learn to to brand the company and to create a uh, a, a cohesive and, and coherent um um uh um what's the word I'm looking for, brand for what you're trying to build. Um, and then at some point, there are going to be those those uh, entrepreneurs or business owners who are really good at when everything is settled down and it's now time to either um, fall back and, and relax or push forward. They're going to be those entrepreneurs that are really good at taking the, the company to the next stage. And it's important as entrepreneurs that we know what we're good at and what we enjoy doing and and where our strengths lie, and also knowing where our strengths and our interests don't lie so that we know maybe it's time to hand this over to somebody that can do this better than I can. Maybe it's time to bring in a CEO. I mean, I, I look to, I, I worked for Microsoft for a long time, and I remember when Bill Gates said, I'm not going to be the CEO of this company. That's not what I'm good at. I'm a CTO, and he brought in Steve Ballmer and other people to come in and actually run the company. So I, I know this is, I'm, I'm belaboring this point. Um, but can you talk a little bit about, um, as a founder, how important it is to recognize where your strengths lie and what to do if you get into one of these phases and you're not the right person for that phase? Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question. I mean, I think, um, I think probably most startup founders, and I would, I would include myself in this bucket, are good at the aspirational stage and the war mode stage, right? And you kind of you think of it it's kind of as like Darwinism, right? Like you have to be good at those stages to get to the peace mode stage, right? It's so like the people that make it through in the peace mode, I think generally are wartime CEOs, right? They just are, right? Because they're used to the chaos. They're used to committing hard into like running a hundred miles at a strat into a strategy and then like being like, oh, just kidding. We're going to go this way instead, right? And like the good news is not a lot of good people are good at that, right? Which is, I think, probably also one of the reasons why so many business 
is fail because they want to spend all this time in peace mode before they go into war mode and like define their culture and their mission statement. And what are we going to be? And like, they want to talk about all this stuff instead of like selling, right. And like building and like, you know, getting rejected a thousand times before you get like that one success. So I think naturally a lot of successful CEOs are probably more inclined to be the wartime CEO. And like the downside of that is like, you don't know when you, you don't, you don't know when to turn it off. Right. So like we, we started to come out of that, you know, wartime mode and I was still wartime CEOing everyone. And everyone's like, yeah, that's great, Matt. But like, we need to figure out who we are now. Right. So like I had to learn how to become a peacetime CEO around like, let's spend some time on the softer side of the business, right? It's not all execution. It's gotta be a little bit of strategy and vision. And I'm still working on this by the way. And culture and right like some of the again the 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 eq parts of the business if you will as opposed to like the execution parts of the business um and and i think the other piece of that is you know i read this the other day that like as you start to become that um peacetime ceo less and less and less and less of your time should be spent in the business executing which is also really really hard for me right so like I shouldn't be in meetings talking about workflows because like one, I'm not good at that. And two, like I should be out talking to customers and coming up with new business ideas and communicating the vision of the company and not in product committee meetings around like, what are we building on the tech side? So in order for you to do that as a naturally inclined wartime CEO, you got to bring the right people into the organization that are good at those kind of things. And this is another like super hard realization for a lot of people and myself included is the people that got you through wartime mode eventually need to either probably find a more narrowly defined role within the company or leave the company. And like, that's really hard for both you as the founder, right? Cause you just went through war with them and now the company needs them to either leave or take a, a narrower scope role, which is going to feel like a demotion to, to a lot of people, but like, that's probably what the company is going to need in order to be successful to get and stay into peace mode and ultimately world domination mode. So like kind of also goes back to like the, the, um, you know, the principles of like, what are you committed to when you start this thing? And it's building this company and providing the service. And that's probably going to mean you're gonna have to make some very difficult decisions. Um, and the di most difficult decisions I've ever had to made, make is really, they're all people related, <laughs> right? They're, they're, how do we get this person in the right position with the company to be successful for both them and the company, or find a good way for them to, to move on from the company and go, go find a, a startup that needs a warrior, right? And not a, a peacekeeper, right? Yes. Yeah, so just like you said, Matt, it is so important to remain cognizant of how not only our roles change throughout this evolutionary process of a business, but how our employees and team members and other associates roles change to become successful and remain successful. So to wrap up, Matt, what is next on the horizon for Fund That Flip? What is next in the pipeline for your world domination? I was going to say world domination, of course, right? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I think, uh, I think, you know, as 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 much as I mentioned, um, you know, that you could be in war mode for for a long time. Like the the other thing I learned about this is, um, you know, starting a company is is a little bit of like a hurry up and wait game, right? Where like kind of kind of feels like you're constantly running a hundred miles an hour, but also it takes a long time to do things that are meaningful. Um, you know, but so, so right now, like we're, we're, we were very much in peace mode and then we were in war mode. And now we're kind of working our way back a little bit back into peace mode. Um, and, and really just executing against what we know has worked for us over the past four or five years. So we're super focused on expanding markets right now. So, uh, we're hiring, you know, business development reps in, um, Boston and Charlotte and Charleston, and eventually, you know, other parts of the U S to kind of um, grow our ground game, if you will. And we've seen a lot of success over the past 12 months in that. So, um, it sounds really easy on the face, but like, how do you one, hire the right person to get them trained three, get them, you know, up to speed on value proposition Four, help them understand how to structure deals and five, having them fit into the culture of the company while they're working remotely, 
um, and will be for the indefinite future kind of on an island, right? So um, we're, we're super dialed into like, how do we make that work and work well? Um, and and um, so that's one piece. The other piece is we're looking constantly to develop um, you know, new products. So we're, we're up to this point have been super focused on short duration loans, right? For the bridge, um, in kind of the bridge space. Um, most, if not all of our customers are keeping some amount of these properties and need 30 year products, right. To, to, you know, keep as portfolios. So, uh, we're working with our institutional capital partners to put that product together. Uh, one of the things we've noticed is insurance is a huge pain in everyone's butt, particularly around fix and flip loans. So like, we're in the process of rolling out a uh, an insurance product, right? So like at point of origination, we can just get you insured with replacement cost coverage with the right co-insurance and everything else um, and purchase that at scale effectively, right? So we can hopefully help bring costs down for our borrowers. So um, again, kind of going back to my fifth point of not falling into complacency, like that's now where I like to spend my time, right? Is going back um, with these, these what I think at least anywhere are cool ideas and validating them and trying to put them to, in place and getting them to market and then getting out of the way and letting our operational people actually make it work. <laughs> Very That's cool. so cool. Very cool. And I think it's especially cool when you look at all of those things wrapped up in the term world domination. It just takes on an entirely new meaning and makes you realize that there are so many amazing, huge things that you're going to keep doing. Very cool. Thank you. So we're running a little bit long. So we're going to skip the four more for today. Well, we're going to skip the four. We're not going to skip the more. Um, but I do want to ask one question um, from from the four um, that I, I know our, our listeners will very much appreciate. If you had to give one tip to our listeners that might be um, in the process of starting or growing or scaling a business that you haven't mentioned here today, what's the best tip that you would give our listeners? Yeah, I think I think the big one is like don't worry about what other people are doing. Um, you know, I think uh, a lot of us it's easy to and I did this early on like look at all these other real estate crowdfunding platforms that were getting started and how much money they were raising and the traction and the growth and like at the end of the day none of that matters, right? Like so the more f business is personal, right? We can say it's not, but like business is very personal and like what matters most is that you've got a very clear understanding of like what you want and what you care about and the business that you want to build and the way that you want to build it. Um, and I think too many people get caught up in, you know, looking at the Joneses, if you will. Right. And, um, one, it starts to kind of like make you feel bad, right. Inadequate. And like, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you this much from the outside looking in, you know, and even through this conversation, it may feel like we're super successful, we got a lot of problems and a lot of crap and like, it's hard and it's not, you know, there's more bad days. There's many bad days as good days, even for successful companies. And that's, that's true of your competitors. Right. So I think, you know, what gets put out in the media and what companies put out is always the good stuff and never the bad stuff. And like you as a, a founder or CEO or business operator, you see both of it from your side, probably with more of a focus on the bad stuff. And the more you look at, what other people are doing, the, the worse you're going to feel. And like, that's just one, it's not right. It's not accurate, but two, it's not productive and it's not healthy. And it's ultimately not, um, you know, probably why most people start a business, which is because it's fun, because it's exciting, because you get to control your own destiny. So like, why are you looking at other people? It doesn't matter. <laughs> Love it. I, I absolutely love that. Okay. So let's now jump right to the more part of the four more. So can you tell our listeners uh, where they can find out more about you, where they can find out more about Fund That Flip, maybe where they can connect with you and uh, and anything else you want to, uh, to to mention to our listeners? Yeah. So fundthatflip.com is the website. We've, we've got a lot of good uh, information on our blog. We do a couple podcasts uh, of our of our own um, that we've got stuff on. So check that out. Um, I'm on LinkedIn, Matt Rodak, one of I think the only or few Matt Rodak, so it shouldn't be too hard to find on there. And I'm in New York if you do need to find me. Um, I try to respond to LinkedIn messages and then obviously email. Um, just Matt at fundthatflip.com is, is probably the best. Awesome. Matt, we really appreciate having you here today. Uh, I appreciate you as a friend and colleague and thank you for, for sharing so much and, and being so open with us today. Thanks for having me. This is great. Absolutely. Thanks, you Matt. Soon. See Thanks, you Carol. soon. Thanks, Jay. Bye. Talk to you soon. Wow, that was just great, wasn't it, Jay? I absolutely love how Matt was able to break down the evolution 
of a business into five distinct stages using analogies that, frankly, I haven't heard before in that type of context. It really made me look through it with a different lens and loved every little last bit of it. Absolutely. I've gotten to know Matt uh, over the last few years, and it doesn't surprise me that he he is so analytical about building and growing his business. Um, but it is, it was amazing to hear. And I, I just, I, I love that that progression. And like I said in the intro, um, I really, I'll never think about growing a business the exact same way again. And, and this will definitely be valuable the next time we start a business. So yeah, I, I absolutely love that. All righty. Are we good here? Let's wrap it up. Okay, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in. Um, we're not going to talk to you again before Halloween. So have an amazing Halloween. And uh, we will talk to you next week here on the Bigger Pockets Business Podcast. She's Carol. I'm Jay. Now go after world domination today. I had to go there. I love Clearly. it. <laughs> have a great week, everyone. Happy Halloween. See you soon. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>